Thank you very much for the opportunity. This is a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to tell you about uh, the insights that we've gained from the Sofila modern code integration and also uh, follow up a little bit on the theme that Mark set up of uh, sort of reflecting how that has given us insights into human biology and specifically human disease. So uh, what I'm going to present today is the result of the analysis working group uh, and the data analysis center, which you can see uh, here is uh, very friendly and working uh, closely together. And uh, this has been really a tremendous adventure, I would say, through uh, integrative genomics. So the folks uh, doing the work uh, are uh, sitting here in the audience. Uh, ben Brown, for example, uh, Peter Park, Peter Kurchenko, uh, Matt Eaton, um, Dave McAlpine, Eric Lai, Steve Hennikoff, um, Casey Brown and Nicholas Negra from Kevin White's group, um, as well as, co of course, uh, Lincoln Stein, Goss McClum, and uh, the DCC. Uh, to, to, to name a few, and uh, they're uh, contributing from very different uh, classes of biological elements, but at the same time, each of these folks have, has sort of really come together to, um, uh, to, to contribute to the integrative analysis. So what I'm showing here is the work of many, many people. So um, I would like to, uh, again, use the same slide that Elise showed earlier to basically tell you how uh, we're actually thinking about all these different classes of elements uh, with uh, a lot of different assays coming together and giving us different glimpses of what is the underlying uh, sort of biological uh, uh, story of the genome. And you've also, you've, you've also heard from the Data Coordination Center, this pointer doesn't really work from the Data Coordination Center as to how even putting all these data sets together has been a tremendous challenge. And this is the uh, thousand or so data sets that uh, have been linked through the science papers for immediate download uh, as of uh, December 2010 uh, in uh, a lot of work from the DCC. Uh, and this is uh, the total tally as of today. You can see that the number of data sets has actually doubled uh, across uh, the, the different types of uh, regulatory elements. So Mark already did a great job in sort of introducing all these classes of elements in terms of uh, mRNAs, non-coding RNAs, microRNAs, siRNAs, pyRNAs, uh, also comparative uh, transcriptomics, uh, looking at variants uh, of uh, chromatin as well as nucleosome turnover, looking at histone modifications, chromosomal proteins, and uh, understanding the complexes of uh, replication, origins of replication, timing, differential replication, and then transcription factors. So uh, when you start simply overlapping all these elements together, what you end up is this astonishing picture where if you started out with, say, the protein coding annotation of uh, the Drosophila melanogaster genome, you would cover about 20% of the genome. And as you start adding these small RNAs, 3' UTRs, non-coding RNAs, uh, POL2, TF uh, binding, transcription factor binding, insulators, additional bound proteins, polycom domains, uh, origins of replication, enhancer and promoter states, transcribed states, heterochromatic states, introns, you end up seeing uh, what fraction of the genome each of these elements covers by themselves. And as you start piling them onto each other, you end up with more than 75% of the genome or nearly 85% of the genome covered for both the uh, overall genome as well as uh, the conserved genome shown in red here, you see an even uh, higher fraction of the genome being covered. So what we've gone uh, from is about 20% of the genome being quote unquote interpretable based on overlap with protein coding regions to nearly 80% or 90% um, using uh, these diverse assays. And what you also see is instead of just uh, covering the genome each base once, what we see is the number of assays that multiply uh, overlap these, um, uh, these regions in multiple ways. So for example, you see that uh, about 5% of the genome is covered by more than 14 uh, different regulators, and 65% uh, you know, of the genome is covered by at, at least one. And similarly, uh, here you can see the number of overlapping transcripts, the number of overlapping different classes of uh, chromatin elements. And then uh, if you pile all these elements together, you have about 50% of the genome covered by at least four assays and 30% of the genome covered by at least eight assays. So this is not just a painting of the genome. This is a multiple uh, uh, painting by many colors. So for example, if you see this region here where we have several protein coding and non-coding transcripts sitting here on the right, and then these large unannotated region on the left, the moment you overlap uh, modern code data sets on it, you see this uh, increase in the coverage of these coding uh, regions, 
where you can see a lot of uh, small RNAs and uh, non-coding RNAs sort of lighting up and coming from these transcripts. But you can also see these uh, vast regions of uh, bound uh, proteins, for example, that are happening in the middle of these genes here in regulatory elements as well as in the middle of this large intergenic region, which now has a new gene model sitting right in it with many different regulatory elements that are uh, annotated by mod encode. So what we're looking here is uh, really much uh, of what was promised by this encyclopedia of non-coding elements, um, uh, this encyclopedia of both coding and non-coding DNA elements, and sort of uh, the emphasis on these large non-coding regions. And uh, at least just to clarify, uh, I see the, the timer went for 25 minutes. Is that correct? Okay, just checking. So um, where do we go from here? So we, we can certainly pile all these elements together and sort of count the amount of the genome that we're covering. But what I'd like to tell you about today is what do we gain by actually putting all these elements together across these different data types? So for example, we can start annotating coding and non-coding genes and actually distinguishing different classes of transcripts by actually overlapping the transcriptional information across different uh, types of uh, mRNAs or different types of uh, transcripts in the cell, and also overlaying that with evolutionary signatures of the, the patterns of change of these regions. So for example, if we look here in this very small new transcript that sits uh, you know, between these uh, previously uh, unaudated genes, you see that, in fact, this single transcript here contains within a single exon two independent small peptides on the order of 20 amino acids each uh, which we would never be able to recognize unless we had both the extremely uh, precise transcriptional evidence uh, as well as the comparative evidence showing us that the patterns of change here precisely match uh, what you would expect for protein coding regions. <clears throat> you can also go within uh, extremely well-studied transcripts such as uh, this heat shock response element or this uh, exist ortholog that actually uh, determines uh, X chromosome dosage and actually uh, discover new transcribed uh, regions within them that actually fold into well-defined structures that are evolutionarily conserved. And you can also go within protein coding exons and discover microRNA genes that are actually overlapping the protein coding regions and uh, encoding both amino acids as well as short uh, 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 regulatory RNAs that can actually target downstream genes. Um, you can also uh, discover downstream of conserved stop codons regions of overlapping um, uh, functions here where this serves as both a 3' UTR of this particular uh, uh, translation termination region, but you also have an alternative translation termination that simply reads through the stop codon and uh, translates these additional regions. And we found actually 300 of those examples in the fly genome, and actually an, ad an additional four uh, examples in the human genome that again uh, started out from the model organisms before we knew they, they also existed in humans. But beyond these protein coding regions, we'd like to also annotate non-coding elements. And in particular, we've been working with Gary Karpin and Peter Korchenko from Peter Park Lab to actually annotate uh, chromatin regulatory uh, elements, such as enhancers, promoters, and a diversity of different classes of uh, regulatory regions. So as you heard in the previous talk, uh, DNA is wrapped around these uh, nucleosomes, each of which is made up of eight histone proteins, and each of which has a long tail. Uh, of amino acids that can, that can undergo tra post-translational modifications. And there's a large number of these modifications creating many distinct combinations of histone marks, which are very difficult to interpret because you end up with uh, a large number of genome-wide tracks mapping the locations of these modification maps across the genome. But we've, we and others have developed algorithms for actually learning the hidden chromatin states that are actually responsible for the observed combinations of chromatin marks uh, that we can learn completely de novo across the genome and only then overlap with existing functional elements. So in collaboration with Peter Park as well as Jason Ernst from my group, we basically set out to annotate the chromatin states of the uh, Drosophila genome. So first of all, this is a picture by Peter Park that actually shows how each of these chromatin marks is in fact very strongly positionally biased to be in different places with respect to uh, different classes of genes or uh, origins of replication or specific insulator proteins or specific transcription factors. So you can see here that 
each combination of chromatin marks, in fact, perhaps uniquely defines each one of these uh, regions in a very consistent way across uh, the whole genome. So we can use that, for example, to discover new and surprising sometimes uh, classes of elements. For example, we can use that to define promoter signatures based on the presence of, for example, H3K36, H2B, uh, H3K4 trimethylation that is associated with both promoter regions as well as transcribed regions. And you can also use that to actually define new classes of elements. For example, we uh, actually found a new class of H3K36 monomethylation marks that are associated with the replication origins and then uh, collaborated with Dave McAlpine to map those across the genome. You can also systematically learn combinations of these uh, modifications, uh, as I mentioned earlier. So the, this is uh, learning not just the specific combinations, but also the intensity of each of these combinations. And you end up with nine different chromatin states, which uh, we can simply uh, refer to as active transcription star sites, where you can see a high intensity of H3K4 trimethylation and to a lower degree H3K4 dimethylation and H3K9 acetylation. Uh, and then this is extremely enriched for TSS proximal regions. You can define active exons and elongation elements, active introns, both enhancers as well as intergenic, based on, again, specific combinations of these chromatin marks and at specific intensities with respect to each other. There's a specific chromatin state that, in fact, defines male X genes that contains H4K16 acetylation. Um, and is, uh, again, uh, specifically enriched for uh, 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 you know, this class of genes. You can define polycomb uh, repressed elements that are marked by H3K27 trimethylation, heterochromatic elements that are marked instead by H3K9 trimethylation, and uh, other uh, basal uh, and repressed elements in the genome. So this now gives us a handle for going off and annotating the genome using these large uh, classes but we can also go uh, further and actually define more discrete states where specific combinations of marks uh, are, are defined regardless of the intensity. And we've used that to actually define 30 uh, different chromatin states, which uh, correspond to these nine states as you see here. And when we intersected those with a very large array of functional elements, such as nucleosome solubility, uh, hotspots, uh, nucleosome turnover, different classes of insulators, different classes of histone deacetylases, hot regions, early origin, uh, origins of replication that fire early, regions of origin of replication complex binding, as well as different classes of transcription factors. What's really astonishing is that these histone modifications alone can actually pick out each of these classes of elements in different states, suggesting that, in fact, chromatin is encoding a much more diverse array of functions than previously thought. It is not just encoding active and inactive regions. It is instead encoding a vast array of different classes of annotations. So we can now go uh, beyond just um, <clears throat> simply annotating regions of the genome. So before we looked at both coding and non-coding transcripts, and then we looked at regulatory regions. We can now start connecting these regions together to actually piece together regulatory networks that uh, Mark Gerstein alluded to earlier. So the first thing that we can do is, in fact, learn the hierarchy of this network by actually combining transcription factors and microRNAs, and then I'm going to switch to these regions of high occupancy. So just looking at the physical regulatory network, namely which transcription factor is actually physically contacting which target gene, we again find a hierarchical structure where most of the links are, in fact, pointing down, and only a small number of links are pointing up if you arrange the regulators in this particular way. And a very interesting picture uh, emerges if you include microRNAs in this picture that are shown in red surrounding these transcription factors, which is that the feedback from the bottom layers of the hierarchy to the top layers of the hierarchy is, in fact, predominantly happening through microRNA regulators that are increasingly targeted by the bottom layers of, of the hierarchy and increasingly targeting the top layers of the hierarchy, um, which is rather surprising. And this is also uh, found if you study the uh, specific structural motifs of this regulatory network, these recurrent patterns of connectivity, where you see these cascades of transcription factors targeting each other and then feedback coming back through a microRNA layer, just like we see here. So both at the low level of the network where you study the specific patterns of connectivity and at the high level of the network where you study the overall hierarchical layout, you can in fact see this feedback of um, regulatory information from transcription factors through microRNA uh, 
to other transcriptional factors, namely the master regulators that uh, Mark was talking about earlier. So again, uh, just like in human and in worm, in fly, you find these regions of very uh, high occupancy by multiple transcription factors. So if you look at the average number of transcription factors found with each of the regulators that was profiled uh, in uh, the Drosophila genome, you see that only a small number of factors are in fact binding alone, but most of the factors are binding with another six or may, sometimes 10 partners. So uh, this is the median of uh, partners that uh, every location that this transcription factor is bound has, suggesting that in fact very, uh, there are some regions in the genome that are just very, very widely bound, and that's where the name of high occupancy target regions comes from. And in fact, this, uh, this, was, this term was coined by Kevin White in the Drosophila genome. What's interesting here is that we can now bring in these different classes of uh, functional elements to help annotate and understand these hot regions. The first thing that we can do is, in fact, look at regulatory motifs. And what we can ask is, given a particular um, complexity of a transcription factor, which tells us the number of other factors that are binding with it, are the regulatory motifs more enriched to the right or to the left of uh, this class? And what we're finding is that most of the time, uh, it's actually a depletion for these regulatory motifs, suggesting that regions of increased complexity are less likely to contain regulatory motifs, suggesting that as more and more transcription factors are binding, you are less and less likely to bind to your specific motif, and therefore you increase the non-specificity of binding or the non-specific binding. You can also overlay that with the chromatin state annotations that we had earlier, and what you're finding is that specific uh, uh, chromatin states are enriched for either hot or cold uh, regions of transcription factor binding. And uh, a striking finding comes if you actually overlap that with regions of origin uh, uh, of replication complex binding. So as you increase the complexity of a transcription factor binding site, you also increase in an almost linear way the uh, likelihood of binding of the origin replication complex, suggesting an intricate interplay between replication and transcription factor binding that was previously unappreciated. N now you can look in within these regions of high occupancy and search for regulatory motifs that are specifically enriched within these regions. And you end up with a large number of specific regulatory motifs that are predominantly found within these high occupancy target regions and that do not match other existing uh, regulators, suggesting that perhaps a different class of binding may be actually guided to these regions in a sequence specific way and then enabling this non-specific binding by additional regulators. And we're finding a very interesting story that sort of uh, uh, mirrors that in the human genome. When we actually study the interplay of transcription factors, regulatory motifs, and chromatin, we find, first of all, that transcription factors show distinct chromatin preferences. Different transcription factors shown here are, in fact, matching different classes of uh, chromatin states. Uh, and even though they're all matching regions of open chromatin, they're matching uh, differentially promoters, voice promoters, uh, enhancers, weak enhancers, um, uh, a class of enhancers that's in fact lacking histone modification marks, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, when we look at the regulatory motif preferences for each of these factors, we do find indeed that the motifs for these transfer factors are enriched in the regions of binding, which is uh, reassuring but you see additional binding beyond these motifs. Namely, you find that the motifs are in fact, just like we saw in fly, depleted amongst all regions of TF binding, they're depleted in the regions of high occupancy, suggesting indeed that there, in addition to these uh, specific binding, that there's some non-specific binding happening within these regions. And, specific, uh, and uh, particularly surprising were these three chromatin states that lacked histone modifications that showed abundant binding, but also showed um, no uh, non-specific binding. Therefore, these regions, in order to become permissive and bind without a, a motif, they actually require the histone modifications. Open chromatin is not enough, suggesting that open chromatin alone, again, is not, as, uh, is not sufficient information that you need, perhaps, chromatin regulators to recognize these marks to enable the non-specific binding. 
The state preferences also predict the pairwise transcription factor co-occurrence patterns that we observed in the fly. So now if you correct for the chromatin state preferences, you actually uh, remove a lot of these TF co-occurrence that, uh, that we observed across human fly and worm. So we can use this information now to build predictive models of gene regulation. So before we looked at physical regulatory networks of which transcription factor is actually physically contacting what target gene, uh, or at least what upstream region of a target gene, we can now start building functional regulatory networks by actually integrating all that information together. So we're looking at uh, motif instances that are conserved across uh, different species and therefore more likely to be functional. We're integrating with that the physical evidence of binding using chromatin in immunoprecipitation. We're also using correlation information between uh, transcription factors and their target genes, both in terms of their chromatin marks as well as in terms of their gene expression patterns. And then we're putting all of that into a learning framework that predicts, given the vector of information across all of these different patterns, whether a particular uh, transcription factor is in fact targeting a particular target gene. So we can use that to actually define functional enrichments across the targets of uh, genes uh, of the same transcription factor. Namely, what we're finding is that depending on what uh, gene cluster, gene expression cluster you are in and what transcription factor is targeting you, you're much more likely to have the same function and uh, we, can, we can see these functional enrichments across uh, different lines of evidence here. And we can use that information to now predict the likely functions of genes that were previously unannotated. For example, uh, by uh, observing that genes that are targeted by specific regulators are in fact in evo involved in cellular respiration, we can predict that additional genes that were previously unannotated are also involved in cellular respiration. And if we do that in a cross-validation uh, framework, we actually have very strong predictive value for several uh, of these uh, annotation terms, enabling us to predict more than 1,000 new functions for uh, previously unannotated genes in the Drosophila genome. We can also predict regulators based on the stage of development at which they're acting, uh, looking here at embryo, larva, pupa, and adult, and different uh, days or hours of, of development here, where you can see here that uh, at specific branch points, the expression of these uh, regulators, in fact, changes just as, the just as the expression of their target gene changes, predicting uh, uh, you know, the action of specific uh, regulators at specific bran branch points. And we can also develop uh, uh, predictive regulatory models that use this targeting information from the functional network to actually predict the expression level of target genes based on the expression level of uh, the corresponding regulators. So this is, uh, for example, the true expression uh, pattern for the uh, Groucho gene, and these are five of its predicted uh, uh, regulators. So we can, in fact, learn a function for each of these edges that predicts as a sum, uh, as, a, as a linear function, the uh, expression level at each different stage of development for that uh, gene. And we can compare that to a random uh, 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 prediction based on a randomized network, and we see that indeed uh, the randomized network uh, doesn't, doesn't do very well at all. And we can do that for a very large number of genes. For example, here I'm showing the top 1,000 genes, or at least sampling from the top 1,000 genes that are the best predicted. And you can see here both negative correlations for uh, genes whose expression is predicted based on repressors and positive correlations for genes whose expression is predicted based on uh, activators. So how does that all uh, uh, translate now to actually interpreting human disease? So uh, in the ENCODE project, we've actually similarly mapped these chromatin states using combinations of chromatin marks across numerous human cell lines to actually define different classes of uh, enhancer, promoter, and uh, transcribed regions enabling us to now look at any region of the human genome and at a glance observe its activity patterns across different uh, cell types. Now what's really exciting here is that we can now use correlations between these activity patterns, just like we did in the fly, to actually link together not just enhancers to their target genes, but also enhancers to their likely trans regulators that are sitting upstream of them by actually studying these 
vectors of activity for gene expression, for chromatin, for regulatory motif enrichment, and for transcription factor expression across the different cell types. And we can use that to actually predict activators as well as repressors for each of the cell types based on the joint action of the regulatory motifs, the expression of the transcription factor, as well as the activity of the chromatin state. So we can use that to actually define a number of activators and repressors for each of the cell types. And we can now use that information of these predicted regulatory regions in each of the cell types, and then the predicted linking between the transcription factors and these regulatory regions, both downstream in terms of what enhancer is in fact targeting what gene, and upstream in terms of what regulator is targeting what enhancer, to actually start interpreting uh, disease association studies. For example, we find that uh, the top scoring regions for a genome-wide association study for systemic lup lupus erythromatosis is in fact having 18 SNPs genome-wide uh, significant, six of which as in, are in fact falling specifically within the GM enhancers that we have defined using this chromatin state. And if you look within one of them in this particular example, you find that the SNP that is associated with the disease phenotype is in fact disrupting a predicted causal motif for the ETS1 regulator, and therefore resulting in the um, inactivation of this particular enhancer and likely changing the expression of the downstream gene, which is predicted to be a target of this region based on our activity profiles. So we have automated this, so we can now do that for any one region. We can basically read off a regulatory map that ETS1 is a predicted activator of GM cell lines, that GFI1 is a predicted repressor of K562. In this particular case, the disease-associated variant is in fact creating a motif for the repressor GFI1, which is then predicted to repress the activity of this enhancer region and therefore lead to inactivation of this particular gene and therefore lead to the disease phenotype. And we can also, of course, leverage information from comparative studies across 29 mammals in this particular case, where the specific SNPs that are disrupting conserved instances of regulatory motifs are much more likely to be associated with disease. We've uh, automated this process in a tool that uh, anyone can use called Haploreg, where you can actually go and mine the entire ENCODE uh, database of regulatory annotations across specific regulatory motifs, binding of specific regulators, DNA's hypersensitivity across 80 different cell types, and uh, the chromatin state annotation maps across the nine cell types, as well as conserved elements across the 29 mammals, and of course, the coding and non-coding gene annotations, in order to interpret for every SNP that's associated, that's associated with a disease, which of the neighboring SNPs might actually be responsible for the disease phenotype. So uh, overall, what I wanna leave you with is that you can in fact use this type of information to annotate coding and non-coding regions, to annotate chromatin regulatory elements, to define networks of regulator targets and uh, their downstream genes, and to build predictive models of gene regulation. And putting all that together in the example of human disease, you can use that to actually annotate non-coding SNPs and also link them both to the upstream transcription factors that bind them, as well as the target genes that they regulate. So ultimately, our goal is to be able to use that information to systematically annotate uh, human disease. And what that requires is a systematic understanding of gene regulation where we can predict for every coding or non-coding mutation in the genome exactly what the functional implications are likely to be, and that's what the goal of the ENCODE project is. So what we're doing now is comparing fly and worm and, of course, comparing that to human, and uh, we've done a lot of work in defining these orthologs, and tomorrow you'll hear a lot more about sort of how each of these stories plays out uh, when you compare uh, flies, worms, and human. So uh, ultimately, I believe that model organisms can be extremely powerful for actually understanding the relationship between genotype and phenotype because uh, we, can, we can study at a systems level the uh, effect of these functional elements on selective pressures, on trait-associated regions, and also uh, given the powerful genetics and the short time uh, spans, we can use them for systematic mutations as well as uh, drug screening. So again, this has been a wonderful uh, collaboration with uh, the entire uh, analysis working group across Drosophila and uh, WORM. So uh, the, uh, I acknowledge some of the key contributors at the beginning of the talk, and this is the, uh, the full set of uh, authors here for, for our integrative paper.
you, you can see the stars here of uh, a, a very large number of equal contributors because this has really been a, 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 an, an incredibly uh, sort of collaborative team effort. And again, a set of PIs here that are all sort of, uh, again, equal contributors. So I'll stop there and, and take questions. So this sort of gets to the importance of doing um, functional analyses. And so Barbara Wall and others specifically looking at transcription factors. Can you, know, you speak you, into the mic? <clears throat> I'll have to lower myself. Um, <laughs> to our level. So, so um, anyway, the point is that, that transcription factor binding seems to be excessive, right? There's a lot of sites in the genome. I'm not talking about hot regions. I'm talking about... Um, you know, tens of thousands of sites, but only a few of them actually seem to regulate gene expression. And so what I'm specifically wondering about is in terms of using SNPs for doing the analysis of human disease, how much that confounds the analysis, and do we need to have depletions of the transcription factors and an analysis of how that affects transcription before we can actually do the linkage to human disease? You, you have a fantastic point, and uh, I... Uh, so, so as, as you'll notice from, I mean, in, in the next phase of ENCODE, there, there have been several uh, technologies that are funded for actually systematically validating the functional consequences of uh, regulatory elements. And we have been involved in the development of one of those in collaboration with Tarjan Mikkelsen, where we can now test thousands of enhancers that are designed from scratch using plasmids, certainly, and therefore, it's, you know, the, the, the native chromatin context might not be the same, but we can now test the effect of individual mutations on the expression of downstream genes in reporter assays. What we're finding is that the, the causal motifs that we're predicting here will, in fact, disrupt the expression of downstream genes in a reporter assay, suggesting that, in fact, those specific motifs are, um, are responsible for... Um, controlling enhanced reactivity in a way. And in fact, if you do neutral mutations within the binding site itself, then you, you maintain activity of the, of the, of the uh, downstream gene. If you shuffle the binding site or if you make a, uh, a mutation that changes the, the high information content basis, then you in fact disrupt uh, downstream uh, activity. So I think this is one type of technology where you can test individual regulatory elements in isolation I think what we're going to see in the future is, uh, and, and there's a lot of technologies underway for doing that, is ways to actually massively test elements in their native chromatin contest to actually integrate them into the genome. And I think that's, in a way, one of the powers of the model organisms that, that in fact, you can do that uh, systematically. So, so I think we're in for many surprises on the te technological end. Uh, every every you know, few years, we think that, wow, that was a great few years. But I think looking forward, we have much, much more to expect. Sorry. 